Hey everyone, I'm Adam Kelly. We are really excited to announce that the course that we launched a little while ago, 3D Rendered Data Sets with Blender for Beginners, is now going to be launched for free on YouTube. So you will be able to watch all of the videos for free on YouTube. And then if you want the downloadable content for the course, you just have to support us on Patreon. And we want to thank those of you who are already Patreon subscribers. It means so much to us that you have chosen to give us a few dollars to support our work. So we're going to launch this over the course of multiple parts. So keep an eye out for the playlist and any downloadable content links or links to other resources or whatever else you might need. Those will be in the video description. We hope you enjoy. Hey everyone, welcome to the course. My name's Adam Kelly and I'll be your instructor. In this course, we're going to learn how to create a very simple synthetic data set in Blender. The goal of this is not to teach you everything that you need to know about synthetic data sets or everything you need to know about Blender or TensorFlow or anything like that. I think that just tends to get overwhelming and kind of distracting and then you end up just kind of setting it all down just in frustration. So uh, my goal with this course is to give you that introduction so that you feel like you have a starting point, sort of a base point of where to jump off from as you're creating your own 3D synthetic data sets for your own AI training. So what we're going to do is go through the bare essentials of Blender. I'm going to spend just a tiny bit of time going through the interface and, and explaining it. So if you've never used Blender before, that's completely okay. I was expecting that not everyone taking this course would have even installed it before. So uh, you don't need to go and take some intro to Blender course before we get started. Uh, it might help, of course, but not necessary at all. Uh, then we're going to actually create a few models and keep things simple. Uh, I wanted to make a data set of the letter A, B, and C. These are going to be 3D rendered, sort of 3D shape uh, letters that we're going to render from a single camera angle and just rotate them and change the colors. So very simple data set. The goal with the AI that we're going to implement is going to be just to tell the difference between the three. So if we show it a picture of an A, it's going to have to say A. If we show it a B, hopefully it guesses B and so on. Now, if we were to change things up and show it something it had never seen before, like any other letter of the alphabet, it's still going to guess A, B, or C. So just know that going into it, this is not designed to be something that is, you know, going to solve huge problems that are realistic in, in the world or anything. This is, this is designed for learning. So we're going to create that. We're going to render out a complete data set that we can use for training, validation, and testing. Then we're going to implement a very simple image net based uh, neural network. And so this neural network is, is going to be implemented in TensorFlow. We're going to use transfer learning, so we don't have to do a ton of training. The training will happen actually pretty quickly, especially if you have a CUDA graphics card. Um, not required, you can run it on a, a P or on a CPU as well. It, it should work just fine. Um, and then, we'll hopefully get the results that we're looking for. I, I found that this worked very reliably for uh, creating the data set and then training a neural network and then uh, running inference. So you'll see the complete end to end of how to create this simple data set. Unfortunately, with this first section, you don't actually get to test it on any real world images. I didn't have 3D A, B, and Cs laying around that looked like anything I was going to render. So, what I did was uh, I created a 3D data set that looked like a real world object. So this next part is a classifier that can tell the difference between a mug of tea that is either full, half full, mostly empty, or completely empty. So basically what I did was I created a uh, a 3D model of a mug and then just 3D model of tea and then made sort of a transparent fluid that was in it and then rendered it out uh, from lots of different angles. And then Kayla and I took a poster board set up in our kitchen and used some lighting to try and simulate the exact same scene in the real world. We used a simple mug that, that I based the, my 3D model on and filled it up with tea and took a bunch of real world pictures. So 
what I do in this next section after the initial uh, synthetic data set creation portion is walk you through what that project looks like. I'm not gonna teach you every single part of it, especially not the 3D modeling because the reality is that you don't have the same mug as I do. You know, you don't have the same setup as I do, but it'll give you an idea of what it takes to use this exact same method that we're teaching for A, B, and C to do a real world, real example where it's only trained on synthetic data, but it can still recognize images in the real world with very impressive accuracy. So that's the basics of what we're gonna do in this course. I go into way more detail, of course, in all of these things. And just in terms of what you need to get started, just a few things. So you need Blender installed, and I recommend using Anaconda, but really you just need Python installed. So if you know what you're doing, you don't need Anaconda, uh, you just need to have Python installed. And I'm using version 3.7 of Python. Um, Anaconda will manage this, and I'll, I'll show you how to get Anaconda installed. And we're using Jupyter Notebooks as well. So all of the installation instructions for this will be in the coming lessons. I'll try and just point mostly to the documentation uh, in case there's any questions that you come across, but I'll give the basics of how to get up and running. Once you've got everything installed and set up, then we can start on the Blender portion. We are going to get started in Blender. And as you can see in this top corner of the splash screen, I'm using version 2.83.3. Of course, Blender is constantly updating. So if you got a different version from blender.org, then uh, just make sure that it's at least version 2.8 or higher. Uh, if it's too far beyond 2.83, I can't promise that nothing will change, but hopefully things will stay relatively similar in the 2.8 range. Uh, if you haven't downloaded it yet, you can just go to blender.org, download the latest, and if you need any particular documentation, that documentation is under support and there's a user manual that has all sorts of helpful information. I'm going to assume that you don't really have any Blender experience and that you're coming from more of a uh, coding Python background. Hopefully that's the case for most students, but I'll try to make it accessible and not too boring for someone who has a little more Blender experience. Try to hit a happy medium. Part of the way that I'm going to allow people to follow along is there's a plugin that allows me to show the keys that are being pressed. In case you're curious, it's called Screencast Keys. And basically it's going to show what I'm doing. Like if I uh, scroll my mouse wheel or if I hold down the middle mouse, to move around like this, you'll be able to see what I'm doing. So with that, I just wanna show you a few basics of Blender, just for those of you who have not opened this at all, or maybe it's you're a little bit rusty. Uh, just the basics of moving around. When you start out, you've got this big 3D window, and I will point out that there are a few different tabs up here. So I'm in the Layout tab. You can orbit around, the center object with, by holding down the middle mouse button and dragging around. So that'll help you see things from different angles. You can scroll to zoom in and out. And then there is the shift and middle mouse will allow you to pan around like this. There are equivalents to this if you don't have a middle mouse button or you're using a laptop. And the other thing I just wanted to sort of show you really quick in terms of looking at it from different angles. If you have a number pad on your keyboard, uh, it makes it really easy to view things from the front by hitting the numpad one. This is the right orthographic view. You can see this up here, what uh, view we're looking at. Top uh, zero looks through the camera. So there's a few different things you can do there. If you don't have a number pad, the little key that's below your escape key, the sort of accent mark, uh, you can hit that and then it should give you some other, the same options basically that you have from the number pad. So I can, I can go to the front view, etc. Now I can just middle mouse click and um, sort of uh, orbit around to get back out. Now there are a few other things that I'm going to mention before we start actually building something in here. 
you have the left click, which if you click away from everything, then nothing is selected. Uh, if I click on something, it selects it. And you can see that reflected up here in the scene collection as well. So if I were to click on something else, like the camera here, you can see that now this camera object is selected. This is a light that is in the scene. So these three objects, we're actually gonna keep all three of them in the scene. Uh, but I do wanna show you uh, just a couple things really quick about selecting objects. So if you select an object and you want to modify it, there's two different modes that you can be in that are relevant to what we're gonna do. So one is object mode. That's what we're in. And the idea with object mode is any changes you make apply to the entire object. There's also edit mode. You can easily switch between them by using this menu here, object and edit mode. You can also use the tab key. And you can see when I've tabbed into edit mode that now I can see the vertices and the edges and it's, they're, they're highlighted as well. Now, that is important if we want to modify the object itself, the vertices within the object. Think of the object as like a container and then the vertices within as being manipulatable in edit mode. So just, I'm gonna switch back out to object mode with the tab key and show you how you can modify this. So there's this menu that by default may be hidden. And if you click on this little arrow, then this thing will pop out. There's also a shortcut key for that. It's the N key. And this shows the location in the world that this box is. The rotation around the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. The scale in those axes. And then the actual dimensions of it. So what's interesting here is it's located at 0, 0, 0 in the world. It is not rotated. It is not scaled at all. So the scale is 1. If we were to increase the scale in say the X, then it will stretch like this. And I want you to take a look just really quick at the dimensions, just since we're here. These actually are two meters by two meters in the Y and Z. By default, for some reason, the cube that shows up in Blender when you create it is two meters cubed. So it's not one a one meter cube, it's two meters. I am not sure why they chose that, but that's just the way it is. So we can, of course, change this back uh, to 111. And you can manipulate all these things through this menu, if you like, um, moving along the X, moving along the Z, rotating around X, Y, Z. There's lots of different things you can do with that. I'm gonna control Z to undo all of those things. You also have uh, some ways to move things that are with shortcut keys. So if you have something selected, you can do the G key. Um, that'll move it around. You can do the S key to scale it and the, uh, what's the other one? R key to rotate it. So um, I'll, I'll go through all of these things again when we use them. I just wanted to do kind of a, a whirlwind tour there. Uh, the other thing just in this edit mode, we'll be coming back to this very shortly. Um, this is, you're able to do the same sort of manipulations on these points. Now a single vertex doesn't have a scale, so it just has an X, Y, and a Z position. So you can move it around, like I'm, I'm, I hit the G key and I can move this around. You can see it moving up, up here. Uh, if you right click, it will cancel any movement or anything that you've started. So that's always good to know. And uh, you don't have to just work with vertices. You can also work with edges. So if I go like this, you can see I'm moving this edge. Uh, and then there's also the face. And you can move faces around. You can uh, undo that. You can scale them. You can do all this stuff. Okay, so I didn't apply any of those. If you did uh, follow along, feel free to just control Z your way back. Or if you completely messed up your cube, then I'm gonna show you really quick before we go into the next video. Uh, you can always delete an object with either the X key or the delete key. So I'm gonna hit X and then this little menu pops up. You must click it in order for it to actually delete it. If you just move it away, nothing happens. So X, delete, and then now there's no object there. We can create a new object by going up to add 
mesh cube. And then there's our default cube again. Okay, so this is the state that we're gonna start in in the next video where we're actually going to start creating this little scene so that we can create our start creating our data set. In this video, we're going to start creating the scene that will make up our data set. This is going to be the backdrop that we're creating first. And before you do anything, uh, just a reminder, it's always good to save when you're working on something. Uh, when you create a new project, you can just go to File, Save As, and I've already saved it to a spot, so I'm just gonna hit Control S to save my project, to save my progress here, just so that what I have, once I go forward, I can just control S as frequently as I need to so I don't lose anything. Now, the data set we're creating is going to look something like this. We're going to create three different letters, A, B, and C, and we're going to have them randomly be assigned a color and a rotation, and then we're gonna render them against this white backdrop. So this is just a sample data set that I rendered out earlier with three of each kind, you can see that there is three different Bs and three different Cs. So that's the idea of what we'll be creating. So let's start by creating a backdrop. Our camera is positioned right here. And if we hit the zero key to view, the numpad zero key to view through this uh, window, we can see what the camera sees. And again, just a reminder, if you hit the key underneath the escape key, that sort of grave key, I think is what I've heard it called, or, or an accent or a tilde, then you get this option too. So you can just do view camera. We are going to make this cube a little bigger. So the first thing we want to do is scale it. If you hit the S key and then type the number three on your regular numbers, then you'll notice that this up here became three in all dimensions, and you can hit enter, and then that number is applied to the scale. Now, if I undo that, you could of course set all of these to three here as well. Those are, that all works as well. So however you get there, just get a cube that's scaled to three. This is actually six meters cubed, as you can tell by the dimensions. And what we want to do is actually delete these three faces so that the camera can see into it and we can use this as sort of like a photo studio backdrop. Right now, the cube is kind of below the, the flat plane here, so we'd like to move it up. So we can hit the G key, and then if you hit the Z key, then that will isolate your movement to the Z axis. And if you look, sort of where this the bottom of this hits the red line, then look up in the top corner to see what it's sort of changing it to, or right here, what it's changing it to when it kind of gets to that line, you can get a hint, oh, this looks like it's about three meters off the ground, so I can just type in the number three and hit enter, and it will lock it to three meters up. And that makes sense since it's a six meter cube. So now let's go ahead and delete these three faces. And to do that, we need to go into edit mode. So hit tab, and then we wanna make sure we're in face select mode. So click on this button here, and then select one by clicking it, then hold down the shift key and click the other two faces. Now I want you to select the same three faces that I am because it'll affect things down the road. So make sure that you pick the top face, that one's easy. But for the other two side faces, take a look in the top right corner at the XYZ axes gizmo. This will show you which direction is the positive X and the positive Y. You'll notice that the positive X is sort of coming down and to the right on my screen, whereas the negative Y axis is down and to the left. So just pick the face that is pointing in the negative y direction and the positive x direction in addition to the top. Then you can go ahead and hit the x key or the delete key, and this menu will pop up. By the way, if you're ever doing one of these keys and it doesn't seem to be working properly, make sure that you have your mouse in the inside the window. If I'm over here and I hit x, 
it doesn't do the same thing. If my mouse is over here and I hit X, it does work. So it's very context specific. Where your mouse is, is where the thing happens. So we're going to delete the faces here. And now you see that we've got this nice backdrop. We're gonna put our letters in here so that the camera can see it. The only problem is these faces, obviously, since they were part of a cube, were originally facing outward. We don't really want them to be facing outward, but you wouldn't necessarily know it from looking at this. I'll show you a quick trick just to visualize this really quick. If you go into this little menu up here, the one with the two circles uh, and viewport overlays, down at the bottom, there's this normals option, and you can turn this on, and I'm gonna scale it up just a little bit. And now, if I look at it from the side, these lines are actually pointing in the direction that the face is pointing outward. So that gives you an idea of which direction they are. Now we're gonna select all of these. So you could select them with the shift key, or you can hit the A key, which will select all. If you ever forget any of these, by the way, the select menu here has all of these options as well as little hints at what the shortcuts are. So A, if you want none, you can do Alt A. Just some tips there for you. So we're gonna select all of these. We're gonna go to Mesh, Normals, Flip. And now these normals are flipped so that they're facing upward. So this is all we need to do for this backdrop right now. This backdrop is gonna be just a generally white color. Uh, we're gonna leave the material as it is, and we're gonna, in the next video, we're gonna come in and place our letters right around here so that when the camera looks at it, it sees a letter with a white backdrop. In this video, we're going to create our first letter, and once we get it the way we want it, we're gonna duplicate it two times and turn it from an A into a B and then a C. So to create text in Blender, you could start from a cube and try and turn that into an A and that'd be a lot of work and maybe wouldn't look very good. Or you could use the text key or the text object, which is much better. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna go to add text. And now we've got a text object, all right? If you look up here in the corner, it's called text. If you double click on this, we can rename it and let's call it A, just a capital A. And I want you to make sure you do follow that. Don't, don't get creative on this part just because we're going to be referencing this object by its exact name later. So if you customize this, then you're going to have to customize the script later. So just let's just get through um, to that script first and then if you wanna customize it, go for it. So you'll notice that changing the name to A did not change the text, and also that the text is kind of sitting on the ground, and maybe it would be better if it was sort of standing up. So the first thing we'll do is we will change the rotation in the X to 90 degrees. And now it's at least standing up. And if we look at it kind of from the camera's point of view, you can see the text, it's fine. We need to change this text so that it actually says A, and the way we do that is edit mode. So you can either go up here and change it, or you can hit the tab key. And now we have this cursor here, and if you hit backspace, you'll be able to delete it and shift A to create an A, and then hit tab again to exit edit mode. If you hit enter, it'll probably create a new line, so don't do that. Just make sure you hit tab to exit edit mode. So now we've got this A, which is great. It would be nice if it had some thickness to look more like these letters do. So that's actually quite easy as well. We haven't really talked about this menu over here, but there's a lot of interesting stuff going on over here. Ignore these top parts for now. There's, there's a lot going on, but that's sort of related to the entire scene, to the entire file. These have to do with the object in question that we're working on. So this is the general object properties. These are tabs. These are modifiers, physics, uh, constraints, and finally this one down here, well, this, finally this one is the material, but we'll get to that in a moment. We're gonna work on the text really quick. And we want to go into geometry, and we wanna set the extrude value 
and we're going to extrude it 0.12 meters. And you don't have to type in the M. By default, any value you type in is a is in meters. By the way, if you did want to do centimeters, you could do 12 cm, and 12 centimeters is 0.12 meters. It does that conversion for you. So now we've got this thick A, and that's good. The only problem right now is if we rotate this, and I'm just going to demonstrate really quick this, if we were to rotate it around the Z axis, which you can sort of see on this gizmo, the Z is upward, then it rotates around this orange dot. And that's going to be difficult to keep our camera focused on if it's rotating around that. We'd rather have it take up the entire screen, sort of with a box, and have the center of it be here. So I'm going to set this back to zero. And we're going to change the alignment inside the paragraph section to center and center. And now you'll see it is in the floor, but at least now it is centered. And if we were to rotate it around the Z axis or the X axis, it looks okay. So I'm going to control Z both of those. And now that it's in the floor, it's probably a good idea to move it up. So if we just click on it, I'm going to set it to a value of 0.4. So it's 40 centimeters off of the ground. So now you can see that it is pretty well placed so that we can rotate it without it getting stuck in the floor or anything. Then we need to set a material on this. So let's go into the material properties. Make sure you have it selected still. And we want to add a new material by clicking this button. And this material, let's just call this letter material. And just try to name it the same way as me because we're going to be doing a little scripting later. This one is less important than the object names, but still helpful if you match me exactly. So uh, that's a space in between letter and material. And once you have that created, it's not going to look any different. So let's change the base color, and if we switch into RGB mode, let's crank up the red, lower the green, and lower the blue. And now it's red here, but it's still not showing up here. This is because we are in just this default object mode where kind of everything is gray by default. You could go down here and change in the viewport display and make it show up as red, but we're actually not going to do that, so I'm going to control Z to undo that. What we want is to visualize it in this material preview mode. So if you click this one, now you're going to see it's much brighter. It's much easier to see. Um, and now we can work from here. Um, so we have this red material on here. We have it placed well. This is actually all we need to do for our letter. We just need to create two more of these. So I'm going to select this, and we can go to Object, Duplicate Objects. The shortcut key is Shift-D. So I'm going to duplicate the object, and then it kind of hangs on to my, uh, my cursor here until I hit the right click. And then it will kind of lock into place where it was. This is called A.001, so let's rename this to B. And we'll make sure we have that one selected. Let's actually hide this first A by clicking this little I symbol. And then we can hit tab backspace B. And now we've got a B character. So it's basically exactly the same. It's in the same spot as the A. Uh, so that's great. So now we just want to duplicate one of these. It doesn't matter which. I'll do shift D and then I'll right click. And let's just do tab first this time, C, tab again, and we can rename this to C. And we don't need to set new materials. We're going to use the same material for all three of these. So now we've got these three letters. So let me just hide them. So we've got a C, a B, and an A. And the idea is we'll show one at a time, and we'll render it as is. And make sure to save your work.
In this video, we're going to talk about the lighting and the camera. So the lighting is going to be really simple. In this scene, we've got a light already. It seems to be working all right. So we're just going to leave it as is. In case you're curious, it's just a point light and it's got some power settings and a radius setting. It's, it's fine for what we're trying to do. So we don't need to modify that. The camera, however, if we view it with the numpad zero, I think you can also view cameras, active camera. That's, that's effectively the same thing. We're a little far away. Ideally, what we'd like is to have a view of this that's sort of like this, okay? We want a, a box that's just isolating the thing. Because we're creating an object classifier, we need the object to be isolated so that we can say with confidence that this is a C, not this is a C that's got a ton of background behind it. So it's helpful to have the letters be visible like that. So what we want to do is move this camera. And I already experimented with this, so I have some settings that'll work well. So I'm just going to tell you to type in for the position one, negative one, and then let's see, the Z I had 0.6. All right, so now it's way down here, but of course it's looking, you can already tell right now that it's not going to see everything. So we need to change the rotation to be 80, zero, and then this last one, 45. Okay, so now if you hit zero, you'll see that this is still not seeing everything, but it's wide enough to see, uh, see the whole thing. So what we'll need to do is make this a square render, and that is actually not a setting that's on the camera, it is a send it setting on the rendering. So we'll modify some of the rendering settings and we'll talk about those in the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about rendering settings and modify them to get kind of what we're looking for. So we have talked about this side panel so far, about the different things in the bottom, but not the top. And the top one here with this little uh, digital camera icon on it is where we want to look first. There's two rendering engines that we are interested in in Blender, Eevee and Cycles. And by default, as of Blender 2.8, it uses Eevee as the default renderer. And the reason for that is because it is a real-time renderer, sort of like Unity or Unreal Engine, it's able to render very fast in real time. So if we hit the, well, if we go up to the render menu, the shortcut key for this is F12. So that's what I was about to say. If we hit F12, if we render the image, it's able to render in 0.33 seconds. And this is a full HD 1080p image. So 1920 by 1080. Uh, it doesn't look bad. It looks okay. The lighting isn't beautiful and the shadow is maybe not great, but it's okay. We want to use cycles and cycles is using ray tracing. Uh, the reason we're using cycles for this is because it is a lot more accurate. It makes much more pretty images, especially when you're working with reflective surfaces like think of like a, a glass or a porcelain, something like that, where you need to really have an accurate reflection. Uh, and, and Cycles does that, EV just doesn't really do that very well. So we're gonna use Cycles, but I'm gonna show you really quick. If I hit F12, it takes a lot longer. You can see it's doing these different, uh, different boxes at a time, it's, it's really chugging. I'm not sure if you can hear the fan on my computer, but it's it's trying pretty hard to render this out. So I'm, I'm gonna stop that by hitting the X key or the X button. You can actually speed this up if you have a GPU. Uh, if you have an NVIDIA GPU with CUDA compute, then you can actually change this from just CPU to GPU compute. And it's possible that you do not have GPU compute enabled, and it's looking like maybe I need to set this up because I just reinstalled Blender with a new version. You have to go into Edit, Preferences, 
and then system CUDA and make sure that this is turned on. I'm not sure why that was, maybe it just needed to be refreshed. But if you have this, if you have CUDA installed, um, if you don't know what CUDA means, uh, then go ahead and just look up CUDA. And if you have a recent uh, NVIDIA graphics card, it probably supports CUDA. So you can go ahead and go through that install process and then you'll be able to take advantage of GPU. If you don't have it, that's fine. It'll just take a little longer to render your images. So I'm gonna use GPU compute and render this again. And you can see that it's quite a bit faster, but it's still producing that same quality of image. So rather than make you sit here and watch this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this because we do not want images this big. The images that we're gonna be using are more like this size. And so we need to switch down into this tab right here. This is the output properties. You can see the little icon is like a photo printer. The resolution is really big. Now the object classifier we're using only takes in images that are 224 by 224. So for us to render at full HD doesn't make any sense. So let's set this to 224 by, whoops, 224. And now you can see that this square shows the entire letter and some space at the bottom for the shadow. Now you don't see the shadow in this view because we're in this material view, but you can either render it like this, and now we see the shadow, or, and you can see it renders a lot faster when you're rendering a small image, or you can also do this, which is a rendered view. And, uh, you can see it's kind of grainy. It kind of fills in as it calculates the lighting, but this is a nice way to preview the way things look um, or will look when they're rendered. Uh, one thing up here that I didn't talk about is the sampling. So this viewport sampling is 32. That's how it's able to go as quickly as it is compared to when I render it, which we do 128. If you want to have a much higher quality image, you can crank this up and render it and it should look a lot better but we can leave these at 128 and 32. Uh, we're not trying to create the highest fidelity images here. And in fact, some additional noise, at least in some of the research I've seen on uh, image recognition neural networks, adding noise actually is tends to be helpful because if it can still figure things out with noise on, then it can definitely figure them out if there's less noise. And real cameras introduce their own amount of noise also. So it's just, um, it seems to work out in our favor, which is nice. I wanted to talk about just a couple more things in this output setting, output settings thing here. So one is this frame start, end, and step. If you've used Blender before, or even if you haven't, um, you probably have some notion of the fact that this is a rendering software. It's meant for creating 3D animations. If you have done any animation, then you'll know about the this thing down here. This timeline basically allows you to make, well, I'll just demonstrate really quick. So if I select this A, I can insert a keyframe. I'm gonna, don't try and follow along. I just wanna show you this really quick. And then I can set another keyframe here after I've like moved it over. I can insert another keyframe and I'm gonna switch back into this mode so it's faster. And then you can, it basically animates between the two. So that's great and it could work well for creating a synthetic data set, but in order to have more power, more control over what we're doing, we're actually going to render and change our scene with scripting, with Python. So we're not going to worry about these frames. This is just controlling which frames it would render if you were rendering it, what the frames per second is. None of that is relevant to what we're doing. We're just going to render individual images automatically and save them as files. Normally when you, when you render an image, it saves it to an output directory. And this one by default, it goes to the temp directory and you can uh, click on this. It's going to C colon slash TMP and it's going to output a PNG 
in RGBA format, color depth eight. So leave all that the same. I just wanted to point it out um, that we're doing sort of a different path here. We're gonna go the scripting route instead of rendering with this option right here every time, because obviously we don't wanna sit here and click this for you know a thousand images. And we also wanna have a little more control than your traditional animation allows inside of Blender.